Okay, uh, good morning to our HASP scholars out in Zoom land. My name is Tom Glover, the coordinator for today's class, Put It in Drive, the development of the world's first automatic, automatic transmission. Our presenter today is Robert Elton, who has a long and varied work history in the world of automobiles. He started working for Hydromatic as a General Motors Institute co-op student in 1965. He says he got too restless to finish his studies at JMI, so he started his own business repairing and modifying cars. Eventually, he did return to school and earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Michigan. He also earned a BSME and an MBA degree from Kennedy Western University. When he was able to find new employment, ready to find new employment, he went back to his first love, the automobile business, with a job at Chrysler working on passive restraints. His next step was a job with GM's Advanced Engineering Group, where he worked on the Chevrolet Caprice as well as the cop car and taxi programs. Eventually, he headed up what's called the Cardboard Modeling Group at the Advanced Engineering Facility. This group made cardboard autom automobile parts so they could quickly assess their feasibility for manufacturing and assembly. His next step was with Johnson Controls in their automotive seat manufacturing business. Here he was rewarded with many patents on seat mechanisms and published papers on seat comfort. Following four years at Johnson Controls, he went to Ford and worked at a prototype shop where he oversaw the building of several show cars. Then to Chevrolet to help with the problems of this, with the uh, Chevy Suburban then back to Ford again to do the layout for the first Ford Transit. His last job before retiring in 2015 was, you guessed it, back at Chrysler, FCA Chrysler now, working on seating concepts and mechanisms. Bob's retirement hobbies include, no surprise, building cars from scratch. And he'll show you pictures of one of them as part of his presentation. Mr. Elton also has a keen interest in automotive history and has authored numerous published article, articles on the subject for various magazines, including Michigan History Magazine. That's where I became aware of him. He is a member of, and he sits on the board of, directors of the Society of Automotive Historians. Bob and his wife of 51 years lived in Ann Arbor, and he is presenting from his home in that fair city this morning. With that, I am pleased to turn the microphone and camera over to Bob Elton, where he will put it in drive for us. Bob? Oh, thank you, Tom, for the good, the good, uh, the good words. I, uh, when I did this lecture in person, I usually ask everybody, how many people on their way here this morning got into their car, moved the shift lever into drive, and drove off. And usually, everybody in the audience raises their hands. Once in a great while, I find a stick shift pulled out, but pretty much, it's such a common thing that nobody thinks about it twice. Well, if you look at this picture on this first page here, that's a 1940 Oldsmobile. And what that woman is doing was very revolutionary at the time. She's moving that shift lever from neutral into drive, and she's going to drive away without ever having to use gears or even think about the connection of the engine to the wheels. Uh, that was revolutionary in 1940. That was the first fully automatic transmission ever designed, ever manufactured for a car. These are the six guys that created it. Now, Earl Thompson was the leader of this, this team. And the team grew, kind of grew gradually during their time at General Motors. These guys all eventually at one point worked for General Motors. But Earl Thompson was a West Coast guy, worked his way through college, driving the presidents of the college, 1913 Pierce Arrow. Now, I don't know if you've ever driven an old, old car like that, but that's a lot of work. I mean, not only... Are the, is it difficult to start with that big crank, cranking that big engine, which Cadillac solved that problem about this time, but he still had to crank the Pierce Arrow. 
Uh, shifting gears in, a, in an old car like that is quite a, quite a chore. You have to actually slide the gears in the transmission into and out of engagement. And you have to do it skillfully and time the shifting just so in order to not make horrible noises, damage the gears, break things uh, in general. At the same time, trying to steer a big, heavy lot of effort. Uh, Thompson decided cars should be easier to drive. Uh, the, the Pierce Arrow had what was called a sliding gear transmission, which is basically a, a box full of gears, and you slid some of them into and out of engagement. Uh, and like I say, that took a lot of skill. There were other arrangements in early cars. The very earliest cars used a belt. And when you pulled on a, a lever, the, another pulley tension the belt. That worked okay when cars had five horsepower. Beyond that, did not work too well. There were various arrangements of friction drive, uh, wheels against wheels, and that worked well and okay when cars had 10 horsepower, but not much beyond that. And other cars, a lot of early cars used a series of planetary gears. Um, actually, usually just one set of planetary gears with two, two bands or two clutches that were engaged by levers or pedals. The Ford Model T is a classic example of a car with a planetary transmission. And the one big advantage of the planetary transmission was it was hard to brake. However, because the gears were always in engagement. However, all the friction parts wore out with pretty good regularity. And Model T Fords were made this way for a long, long time. And uh, mechanics and handymen at the time got pretty adept at replacing the bands on Model T Ford transmissions. But for most cars, the sliding gear transmission became the norm. And if people wanted to drive, they just assumed that they would have to learn how to manipulate a transmission like this. And believe me, it's not easy in these old cars. Well, Thompson, lifelong goal was to make cars easier to drive. He, uh, after college, he got a, quite a career in, in uh, mechanical engineering positions and, and civil engineering positions, but he never gave up the idea that it should be a lot easier to drive uh, than cars were. So 1918 or so, Thompson invented synchro mesh. So instead of sliding gears in and out of engagement, he uh, developed a series <clears throat> and teeth that would basically could be engaged and disengaged without <clears throat> without clashing the gears. It, uh, actually, as the cone engaged, it sped the gears up to the proper speed to synchronize their speed so that basically everything would would go together without again without clashing, making bad noises or doing bad things. 1918, he had figured out he had this pretty well thought out. So he built up a whole transmission and he took the transmission to Detroit. This was when Detroit was the center of the world for automobile manufacturing. And he started showing it around. Well, it's kind of hard to visualize the difference this would make when all you got is a transmission. That plus to some degree, a center of the not invented here uh, syndrome. And basically, the reaction he got from the car makers was, hey, our customers aren't complaining about this. Why should we worry about it? So basically, he went back to the West Coast and he bought a whole Cadillac and he put his transmission in the Cadillac and this and drove the Cadillac to Detroit. It's a long drive, 1924. Uh, and he showed it around. And again, most of the car companies said, Hey, this is not a problem. Our customers aren't complaining. Except Cadillac was kind of interested. They thought people were wanting Cadillac. Henry Leland was long gone, but the uh, a lot of advanced engineering originated with Cadillac in these days. And uh, Cadillac people said, well, maybe there's something here. So they bought Thompson's patents, and then they hired Thompson to work on adapting this into a production uh, production car. And in fact, 1929, Cadillac introduced synchro mesh 
Well, this was turned out to be a big deal for people. People liked being able to shift gears without making bad noises and causing damage to their cars, expensive damage. It's synchro mesh was such a good concept that it's used to this day, minor tinkering with it. So anybody, all the people in the audience, the holdouts with manual transmissions, they all have synchro mesh transmission, synchro mesh in their tr manual transmission so they can shift gears uh, with ease without, again, making bad noises, damaging the cars. Earl Thompson developed that. This is a picture, actually, this is a picture of a fairly modern transmission, but it looks just like the parts inside a 1929 Cadillac. So Thompson still wasn't satisfied. He still had to know how to use the clutch. And if he didn't know how to use the clutch, he would stall the engine or slip the clutch and ruin the clutch. Or basically, uh, that still required a certain amount of skill. And older clutches were both more difficult to use and more fragile than modern cars. But uh, so he basically convinced the people at Cadillac to uh, let him continue to work on a way to drive the car without having to use the clutch or shift gears. And he worked on what was called a roller transmission or a toroidal drive, uh, which is a sort of uh, infinitely variable transmission. They have those today, but they don't work quite like this. Uh, Machine tools use things like this to get variable speeds for, for that. And that worked for, for passenger car. It had a lot of problems. Uh, you can see there's, by shifting the angle of those pieces between the conical parts, you get varying input uh, output speeds from the same input speed. And this transmission still had to have a clutch. So you still had to have skill to operate the clutch. And if you misuse the clutch, you could easily break the toroidal transmission. They never really worked. Uh, they built a bunch of prototypes. And finally, they got it so that Thompson and the other people on that team said, well, we could do this. But the transmission alone was going to weigh about 300 bucks, 300 pounds, and cost about 500 bucks. Well, you could buy a whole new Ford for less than that. You know, so that basically management looked at that and said, this is probably not a good idea. So back to the drawing board. So Tom ended up with Ralph Beck and Walter Herndon at Cadillac. Uh, Beck was one of these guys who was fixated on planetary gears. And he just knew everything there was to know about planetary gears. I'm sure you've met people who just have a, a, a life's work and are just the ultimate expert in some form of engineering or something else for that matter. Uh, Herndon liked hydraulics and he used hydro, originally the Cadillac using hydraulics to control machine, machine tools in the plant. And this was, uh, this was pretty revolutionary and it contributed to Cadillac being able to make really high quality parts at uh, production speeds. So Herndon, and Beck, basically, along with, with Thompson, uh, created, firstly, a set of two planetary gear sets that could give four gear ratios uh, by basically interlocking or not interlocking some of the, uh, the, the uh, elements of the uh, planetary gears. And Herndon created hydraulic controls to operate bands or clutches to engage or disengage the, uh, <clears throat> the elements of the uh, planetary gear set. And then later on, William Carnegie and Maurice Rosenberg were assigned to this project. And Carnegie was an engine genius. And he worked at the time, Cadillac had started making a V16 engine. They wanted to one up Packard and others that only had 12 cylinders. So they made a V16, which was quite an engineering uh, feat at the time. And Rosenberger was the guy who mechanical things. He was in charge of testing and troubleshooting powertrains. He, uh, it was said that he could just 
put his hand on an engine and tell what was wrong inside. Um, that may be apocryphal, but he was that kind of a guy. So together, they created the first attempt at an automatic transmission. It was really, well, it had a few uh, hurdles to overcome. For one thing, 1935, this is the depth of the depression. Expensive cars. I mean, the sales of Cadillacs fell to almost nothing. And GM was thinking, maybe we should just give up on Cadillac, you know? Uh, this was pretty, pretty desperate and GM didn't have money to keep pouring down the rat hole of making $10,000 cars in a, a market where, you know, 25% of the people in the country are out of work. Uh, however, Alfred P. Sloan thought that the automatic transmission idea was worth pursuing. Now, Alfred P. Sloan, of course, created the modern General Motors and he was a chairman of the board and the president of the company. And so when he thought something was a pretty good idea, lots of people also thought it was a pretty good idea. And Sloan thought this was a good idea because he was a notoriously bad driver. I mean, his, his Cadillacs were always, you know, had dented fenders and the bashed in trunks and things like this to the point where the rest of the board of directors realized it was flat out dangerous to the company to have Sloan driving himself around. And so they forced him to have a, a chauffeur. They would, they would not let him drive anymore. So eventually uh, the company might have failed that Sloan killed himself in a car wreck. But uh, Sloan was, was enthusiastic about the idea of an automatic transmission. So Cadillac basically narrowly escaped closing by coming out with a lower price LaSalle. LaSalle was a sort of a companion car that Cadillac made and a nice car. Um, and that kept Cadillac afloat, but just barely. So because of the uh, support of Sloan, a department called Central Engineering. And so they, uh, they shifted the whole thing to Central Engineering. Well, Central Engineering ran out of money pretty quickly also as a result of the depression. Uh, Charles McEwen was the head of Oldsmobile and influenced by Sloan perhaps, or maybe just because it was his own uh, affection for the idea and uh, said, Oldsmobile will take on the automatic transmission project. So Thompson and his whole team up and moved from Detroit to Lansing and uh, kept working on the automatic transmission. Another key member of this team was Oliver K. Kelly. They called him O.K. Kelly. And he, he joined a team from another part of General Motors. He uh, was fixated on fluid couplings and torque converters. These are me mechanisms where motion is transmitted inside of a, a closed element Part of it is driven by the power input and the other part is basically the output and it is driven by the oil that's contained between the two elements. That's a fluid cover, it's a little more complex, but similar idea. Uh, I've seen basically uh, to demonstrate this, people would set one fan in front of another to plug in the first fan and the airflow from the first fan makes the second fan go around. Well, that's in a crude sense how a fluid coupling works. Uh, they were not alone with that. The uh, Daimler in Europe, English Daimler, there were two Daimlers, the German Daimlers and the English Daimlers. Uh, in fact, the guys were cousins. But the English Daimler had become the car of choice for the king. King didn't really like automobiles, he liked horses, which is a common feeling among monarchy back then, apparently. But they convinced him he had to ride in a car in parades. Well, in order to keep from jerking the king, Daimler put a fluid coupling between the engine and the clutch and transmission so that the car could creep along at parade speeds completely smoothly. The king could stand up, wave his hat, and so on. 
without danger of falling over and looking very unking like. So General Motors bought one of these cars and they uh, studied up on basically Kelly and then, and then Thompson, uh, took it all apart and became familiar with the fluid coupling. Fluid couplings have been used in ships for a while, especially when they went from piston engines to steam turbines. The Titanic had that, in fact, in one of its engines. Well, their first try at an auto was this automatic safety transmitter. They were working up to it because it had the four speed planetary gear sets that had been, they had developed. It still had a sliding gear. Uh, and it still had a friction clutch between the engine and the transmission. And the whole thing was operated by engine oil. Uh, basically, it shared oil with the engine and had its own pump. But uh, it, was a, it was a good try. And basically, the way this worked, uh, you still had a clutch. So when you put, when you wanted to drive off, you, you depress the clutch, you move that shift lever, you can just barely see it in those pictures, uh, into low, okay? And the hydraulic pressure would engage low gear. You had to let out the clutch carefully so as not to stall the engine or break anything. And if you drove off, automatically shift from first to second at a certain speed. Then, you had to move the shift lever to high. You didn't have to use the clutch for this. You just push the shift lever into high and it would shift into third. And after a while, it would shift into fourth. If you came to a stop, you had to push the clutch down or the engine would stall. And if you wanted to go in reverse, you had to push the clutch down and move the lever all the way clockwise, all the way to the right. And that mechanically engaged sliding gears at the uh, back of the transmission and would give you reverse. Well. Oldsmobile wanted this. They didn't have the facilities to manufacture it. So it was made by Buick. And Buick also put it on a few of their cars. Uh, it had a few problems. For one thing, early on, drivers learned they could abuse the thing to get better acceleration out of the car. Uh, and that would quickly damage the, the, the bands that engaged. Uh, uh, Secondly, it used engine oil. Well, engine oil works pretty good in engines, but it wasn't made to work with clutches, bands, and hydraulic controls. And uh, it had problems in the, when, when it was cold, the oil was really thick. Sometimes the transmission of the engine warmed up. Well, that's not acceptable to most people. Uh, and it created sludge. To, particles wore off the bands and the clutches and they joined up with elements of the engine oil and created sludge uh, pretty soon. So you should change when the train. Well, that too uh, wasn't going to happen. So pretty soon, Buick basically rebelled and said, we're not going to make this anymore. This is just a big problem. And so after a year or two, it went out of production. But the germ of the automatic transmission is there. Now the fluid coupling, there's a production Daimler with a fluid coupling. Uh, that particular picture was taken at a, a show, probably fair, but it's fairly unusual car. Um, in 1939, Chrysler, created what they called fluid drive. They put a fluid coupling between the engine and the clutch and a manual three-speed transmission. It still required shifting, but it removed the skill you needed to use the clutch because, because of the fluid coupling, the engine would not stall even if you came to a stop without using the clutch. Uh, they hung, they, they stuck the aim for a long time uh, at Chrysler, even after other cars had fully automatic transmissions. They were kind of enamored of that. 
Uh, I like that picture of the 1939 Chrysler with fluid drive and all the speed lines implying that the woman driving that is uh, speeding off when in fact Chrysler's with fluid drive are notoriously sluggish and uh, uh, <laughs> not exactly at the cutting edge of performance. But it did keep, uh, it did, did basically made it much easier to use the clutch. Now the, and Chrysler made hay with it for a while. Dodge, a little inset there, Dodge is a nice emblem that says fluid drive. They were that young. I still uh, relatives that swore by the uh, fluid drive and would have nothing else. Uh, so they finally created an automatic transmission, hydraulic automatic transmission. Some marketing guy said, you know, that's a lot of, that's a big mouthful and shortened it to hydromatic. And what they did was they went back to their, their automatic safety transmission. They kept the planetary gears, but they added a fluid coupling so that you had no clutch pedal and no clutch. Uh, they kept the hydraulic activation of clutches and bands, but they, to make it automatic, they developed basically a hydraulic analog computer. Now this, was basically the transmission took input from a couple of sources. They developed a hydraulic governor. So the faster the output shaft went, the faster the car went, the more pressure was created by this hydraulic governor. They connected the valve, the uh, throttle linkage. So the harder the engine worked, the more pressure that created. So in other words, if you were accelerating hard, the transmission would stay in a lower gear. If you let off on the gas pedal, all of a sudden there was less throttle pressure and higher governor pressure, the transmission would upshift to the next gear. This is a basic concept that was revolutionary. And nobody ever really thought about these things like this in this way. This team put this together, basically six guys. And they, they did a few other things. And maybe even today, cars with manual transmissions, people would just put it in first gear or reverse, turn the engine off, let the clutch up and get out of the car and walk away. And to some degree, the car would stay there uh, because the engine was now connected to the wheels and the friction and compression in the engine would keep the car from rolling. Well, uh, basically, they wanted to have that same ease of parking and walking away from the car that the manual transmission had. And you're not supposed to do this, but it was common when people did it. You're supposed to set the parking brake. And in fact, in Michigan, it's still the law that you're supposed to set the parking brake, even though a great many people never set the parking brake. So what they did was very clever. Um, they arranged it so that when you put the car in reverse, Like pressure down. And one of the hands get holding the transplanter gears in second gear. So the car was essentially in two gears at once. So it couldn't roll away. Um, now, of course, every time somebody comes to a stop to put the car in park with a mechanical lock uh, that does the same thing. These guys figured out they needed to do that to be competitive. Well, it didn't work very well in a gearbox. These guys had to work with chemists at General Motors and invent automatic transmission fluid. I mean, obviously, before there were automatic transmissions, there was no automatic transmission fluid. And that picture shows a, a, a can of GM transmission fluid number one for Oldsmobile hydromatic drives. Uh, for year-round use. It decided once they developed that, they uh, they could leave it in the transmission for more than a year. <laughs> uh, and next to it is a one for Cadillac. Uh, in 1940, the 
the hydromatic came out on you and Ron was running Oldsmobile and had championed this whole project. So he got to use it for a full year before other anybody else. But Cadillac saw that and thought a luxury car should have an automatic transmission. And so immediately with the start of the 1941 production, Cadillacs had automatic transmissions. And they, uh, much more popular than General Motors. And in fact, Buick, you know, didn't want to be involved in this at all, having had a bad experience with the automatic safety transmission. So the management at GM created a whole new division, the Detroit Transmission Division in Detroit. And they moved Thompson and his whole team back to Detroit. And so they started making these girls bills. Well, it was fairly expensive, you know, easily. Um, it was over $100 in a car that could cost $700, okay, or up to $1,200 for the eight-cylinder versions. But that's, that's a lot of money. And they didn't know how popular this was going to be. Well, they grossly underestimated the popularity of this. Half of the people that bought Olsen Pills wanted a hydromatic. So those poor guys at the Detroit Transmission Division were working 24-7 making these. And they quickly they took over the future body next door. And they still couldn't make enough of them. So Oldsmobile decided, well, if, if people want these, we're going to make them buy the, the expensive eight-cylinder Oldsmobile. Uh, so that basically a good proportion of the eight-cylinder cars had a, had a lot bigger margin on those cars than they did on the uh, six-cylinder cars. Although you do find six-cylinder Oldsmobiles with, with the hydromatic transmission. And Cadillac saw this, and they immediately had to have it in their, in their cars. I mean, how could a luxury car not have a hydromatic transmission? And so it was incredibly popular with Cadillac, and they, they more than half of the Cadillacs in 1941 had a hydromatic transmission. Uh, like I say, and those poor guys back at the Detroit transmission plant, they were still working 24-7 doing this, the very first hydromatics had a sliding gear reverse, just like this automatic safety transmission did. So you had to make the car come to a complete stop. You had to move the shift lever all the way clockwise. And that was actually moving those gears into engagement. Uh, well, pretty quickly, like about a year and a half after they started making these, they decided that was kind of a, a weak spot. And the one of the few things that made it a little difficult to use. So they set another set of planetary gears and another clutch to engage those for reverse. And uh, that was that became a fully hydraulically controlled transmission that did everything with no input from the driver other than deciding whether to go forward or back or not at all. And there's a cutaway, the very first hydromatic transmission. You can see the fluid coupling, see the planetary, the, the uh, hydraulic controls lived in the bottom. And it's this one the, being the very first still had sliding gears for reverse. Um, I didn't show a more complicated picture because it's hard to understand it without a lot of study when you see line drawings of all these parts. But, but this illustration really does show the uh, the hydromatic and the concept of it and how it actually worked. Uh, in the middle, this is the gear that's driving the governor to uh, that's driven off the output shaft. And there's basically some other little gears that drive the pump that creates its own hydraulic pressure. It relies, does not rely on the engine's oil pressure to operate. Um, it's quite an achievement. I mean, that there was literally Nothing else like it in the world. You can see the fluid coupling has only two elements. Okay, I don't know if my arrow shows up here, but that one, this one is driven by the engine, and this one is driven by, drives the, uh, the gear train. The color code in there kind of indicates that. A fluid coupling has no torque multiplication inside it at all. So if you, if you 
the engine puts 100 foot pounds of torque into it, you get 100 foot pounds of, you lose a little speed because of the inefficiencies involved. And when you come to a stop at low speeds, at very low speeds, torque converters or fluid couplings and torque converters too are very inefficient. That's why you can come to a stop with the engine idling at, uh, in those days, engines idled about 350 RPM. The torque converter is extremely inefficient, so the car will stand there with only a light, uh, moderate pressure on the brake pedal. And as the engine speeds up, the efficiency increases with the sixth power of engine speed or input speed. So they become much more efficient the moment you start driving off. Uh, it's a characteristic that, that basically made them ideal for this, this application. Now, OK Kelly developed this fluid coupling. And among other things, in the, in the I did, I kept finding references to Kelly's Crick. Well, what that was, was Kelly lived in a house with a relatively fast flowing creek run behind it. And they developed, he developed the shape of these blades and things by basically putting them in the creek and watching the water flow around them. Uh, this was a state of the art for uh, developing fluid couplings at the time. And uh, basically, considering the crudeness, uh, did a pretty good job because that fluid coupling really didn't change for most of the life of this first generation uh, automatic transmission. So Kelly's Crick, it's a, another interesting example of, uh, you know, using what you got to create uh, what you need. Well, almost immediately after they started making hydromatics, World War II broke out. And that, that basically overturned just about everything in this country, especially in manufacturing. And they drafted men by the millions. And one of the important weapons that they were going to need in the war were, were tanks. Well, the tanks that they had were quite difficult to drive. They usually used an airplane engine. They didn't want to do that because they really needed airplane engines for airplanes. So GM and Cadillac created this tank, which basically took two Cadillac V8 engines and hooked them up to hydromatic transmissions and put them in this tank. Well, it had one advantage was they were already making these, so they were all tooled up and they just basically went in the factory and made these things 24 seven. But a big advantage was they could take guys who had never driven a tank and teach them how to drive a tank with automatic transmissions uh, a lot easier than any of the complicated tank mechanisms they had before. In fact, they were drafting in this country back then. A lot of people didn't even know how to drive, much less drive a tank. Uh, this basically allowed them to deploy these tanks uh, eventually in Europe much more quickly than, than they otherwise could have. Uh, similarly, with big trucks, all of a sudden, they really needed heavy duty trucks. And Studebaker basically led, led the country making heavy duty trucks for the war effort, even before we were in the war, uh, because of FDR's relationship with the guys that ran Studebaker. Uh, he said, basically, we need 100,000 heavy trucks, not sure when we can pay you. And Studebaker signed up and said, yep, we'll get right on it. Well, when the war really started, GMC and other companies made a lot of heavy duty trucks. You see often the classic six wheel, six by six truck, six wheels, three axles, six wheel drive. Well, driving a big truck like that's pretty difficult. Uh, and driving a passenger car is not that much of an advantage in knowing how to drive a big truck. And one of the problems with big trucks was the same as it was with old cars, very hard to shift. And the possibility for damaging things was quite high. Uh, if you didn't know how to do it. And when you're in the war, especially if you get, get into the war zones, it's pretty stressful driving anything, right? Much less trying to synchronize gears in a manual transmission. So hydromatic tool, basically a giant size hydromatic. It's like they just made everything about 50% bigger. And they put these things in GMC heavy trucks and they made hundreds of thousands of these things, basically heavy trucks 
that regular people could drive and, and do their part for the war effort, both at home and, and in the war zones. Uh, that was pretty, pretty important. So, okay, Kelly, the whole team kind of split up about this time. Uh, Thompson went off to uh, start his own company, making precision parts uh, and did other things that made it easier to drive and to maintain cars. Okay, Kelly split off to work on torque converters. A torque converter basically has more elements in it than a fluid coupling, so it can multiply torque and act like its own mission. And he was making tanks. Of course, they had the same problem the other tank makers did, and that nobody knew how to drive these things. And Kelly designed a giant torque converter and no gears, and that was all the transmission this big tank needed. I mean, there's problems in terms of efficiency but they weren't worried too much about the gas mileage of tanks during the war. Uh, they were more worried about getting out there and doing the job and being able to maneuver. Uh, well, the war ended. And again, GM was still a little uncertain as to the continuing popularity of automatic transmissions. So they started offering it to other car makers. And the first car maker they, they went to was Hudson. And they called up Hudson and they had a nice talk about the hydromatic. And the Hudson people said, eh, we don't need that. And uh, turned them down. Well, that was 1946. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why the streets are not full of brand new Hudsons. And that was one of them. Um, but they, they sold it to their own division, Pontiac. Uh, Pontiac was a lower priced car, but they decided even the, the relatively costly price of a hydromatic, people would want one. And in fact, they did. Uh, they sold it to GMC, who saw how it worked in their big trucks. They started using them in their pickup trucks and the smaller trucks. Eventually, Nash came, uh, Hudson did come around eventually, but Nash, Kaiser, Frazier, Woolies, all jumped on the hydromatic bandwagon as quick as they could and like I say Hudson eventually came around when they realized that people were buying a lot of Nash's and Kaiser's and Frazier's <laughs> with automatic transmissions. Uh, Willys made a car. They, they basically got to make Jeeps, but then in the 50s, they came out with the Willys Arrow, small car on the lower right there, and uh, put a hydromatic in that. Lincoln pretty quickly really if Cadillac had a hydromatic we were never going to sell a luxury car without it. And they basically signed up for the hydromatic as quick as they could. 49 Lincoln had a hydromatic. And they used it through 1954, in fact. And even Rolls-Royce and Bentley saw the writing on the wall, and they signed up for hydromatic. And that basically uh, helped them maintain luxury car leadership in Europe when lots of other luxury car makes after the war just went away. Well, another advantage, another interesting thing, role of hydromatic. After the war, a great many veterans came back disabled. Uh, I mean, war, many people were killed, but many millions more were disabled and, and loss of a leg or an arm or, or other disabilities that basically kept them from driving a stick shift car. So Oldsmobile created a program where disabled veterans could buy an Oldsmobile with a hydromatic at a discount. And one of the first people enrolled in that was Bob Dole, who became a spokesman and a salesman for Oldsmobile, showing uh, Oldsmobiles with hydromatics to, to veterans groups and to other veterans. And from that, basically got his start in politics, uh, eventually running for president. So the ads and the other pictures you see, promotional material, always showed women with hydromatics, as if women had a harder time driving cars. Well, that's, that's really an unfair stereotype, although it was a common stereotype. There were lots of people who were able to drive because cars had hydromatic transmissions, and the disabled veterans were, were just one of them. But lots of people who just didn't have the skill or who had other problems manipulating a clutch and a, a shift lever were now able to drive. And I think everybody realizes when you're able to drive, you can do so much more in your life. It sets 
cars set people free and the hydromatic set more people free. And uh, in that sense, it made us a much more, even more mobile society than what we were already becoming. Uh, meanwhile, Kelly had split off and he went to work at Dynaflow at, at Buick and he liked torque converters more than he liked fluid couplings. So he became the, the uh, expert, the world expert in torque converters and developed some better methods of testing and putting the pieces in the creek behind his house. And he created an automatic transmission for Buick. Buick didn't want anything to do with hydromatic. They were still mad about the automatic safety transmission. Kelly created the Dynaflow. And 1948, that came out on Buick's and gave Buick an automatic transmission that was as easy to use as a hydromatic. Up until 1950, GM made 100% of the automatic transmissions in the world. Nobody else had this technology up until then. Uh, and somewhere, somebody was busy making up great names for automatic transmissions like Dynaflow. What a name. But wasn't all was not perfect in hydromatic world. There were problems that were arising. Um, one, one of them was the hydromatic had to had hard shifts. I mean, you knew when it changed gears. Uh, and part of it was, was synchronizing with the crude anal hydraulic analog computer they had of the two, three shift. They had to engage, disengage a band in the clutch and engage another band and another clutch all in the right sequence, in the right timing. Uh, and that often made the car jerk pretty good when it was making a two, three. Another problem uh, was it the creep at idle. Torque converter, a, a fluid coupling is more efficient than a torque converter at low speeds. So it had harder on the brake to keep the car from creeping when they were standing still. Uh, the Dynaflow, that was one of the things they bragged about with Dynaflow is it took less effort to keep the car standing still. And that was a valid thing. Another problem that plagued hydromatic for another 20 years uh, was the shift selector pattern. If you looked at the, saw that in the earlier picture, the shift quadrant goes neutral, drive, low, reverse. And it was done that way because in the very first hydromatic, you were manually engaging the reverse gears. Well, shortly after that, when they put a hydraulic engagement for reverse, uh, it didn't need to be that way, but it continued kind of out of custom. Well, the problem with that is it was easy for people to shift into low or reverse inadvertently, uh, making the car go forward or backward when they weren't expecting it, running over their friends and neighbors and things. Uh, this was a problem. And eventually, other transmissions didn't have this limitation and started having uh, reverse and drive separated by neutral which was good machine tool uh, practice. In fact, in General Motors factories, every one of their machine tools had to be like that. Or their uh, um, worker comp insurance would have been a lot higher, it was required. So eventually, the government never required this change. What they did say about 1966, 1965, was they wouldn't buy a car without this. So that basically the newest, by that time, hydromatic had a new transmission and all the transmissions became what we, what we would consider standard now, park, reverse, neutral, drive, low. Um, that was a problem with the hydromatic for a number of years. And another problem was that competitors started showing up. I mean, once hydromatic showed them how to do it and Dyna, and to a lesser degree Dynaflow, uh, other companies started making their own automatic transmissions. And they differed from hydromatic in a couple of ways. Uh, the shift, to, to get around the shift quality problems, six, added a second fluid coupling in the transmission. There's the main fluid coupling uh, over there. And the, uh, 
They added a second one. And the theory was that when the transmission went to shift from second to third, they would suck the oil out of the smaller fluid coupling, make the shift, put the oil back in. Well, that made the shift a lot smoother because the engine was kind of disconnected while it was shifting. But it was quite involved and it made for kind of a leisurely slow shift. Uh, but still, Hydromatic was still the gold standard in automatic transmissions. Uh, when they did this, Rolls-Royce decided they didn't want to go with a twin coupling hydromatic. So they bought the rights to manufacture the original single coupling hydromatic and used that, made it in England and used it in their cars through 1965. So this basically, this breakthrough device, the breakthrough product continued unchanged in some markets for 25 years. Pretty amazing when you think about it. There's the shift selector from the Cadillac. You can see it's pretty easy to slide from low to reverse. I uh, basically, this last summer, I've been going around taking pictures of uh, hydromatic shift selectors in cars and other transmissions too. And people at car shows are kind of always give me the funny look when I tell them, well, let me take a picture of your shift selector. <laughs> Dynaflow developed the, the, the uh, torque converter transmission, a couple of versions of it. And in fact, the beautiful uh, enameled uh, emblem, the one on the back of Buicks that said Dynaflow Drive. And it was less efficient than hydromatic, but it had no shifts at all. So it was really smooth. And apparently people that bought Buicks didn't care about the gas mileage that, uh, that resulted. Buicks became very popular. Uh, and Old Packard was trying to hang on to their luxury car image. They developed their own automatic transmission, similar to a Dynaflow, but it had a uh, lockup clutch in the torque converter to eliminate torque converter inefficiencies at uh, highway cruising, get better mileage. Well, it didn't really help Packard all that much. They eventually, fairly soon, went out of business. Packard did do something interesting, was the electric shift selector. Instead of having a lever, they had these push buttons with electric solenoids that moved the shift selector that was on the side of the transmission. Uh, not the most reliable arrangement given the uh, technology of the times. Studebaker, another smaller company, developed their own automatic transmission. And this was pretty, pretty important, this one. Uh, <laughs> They were short on fancy names, so it was just called the Studebaker Automatic Drive. It was the first time used a torque converter coupled to a gearbox, planetary gears. They uh, it only had three speeds, but the torque converter gave them enough extra torque multiplication to uh, give pretty good acceleration. Um, and basically, it would, it would downshift under heavy loads, just like the hydromatic. Uh, and it had a lockup clutch in the torque converter to provide better efficiency to eliminate torque converter losses at highway speeds. Well, this set the pattern for automatic transmission for the next 40 some years. I mean, basically everybody made transmissions like this eventually. Uh, and it turned out to be quite popular in Studebakers. Well, Ford did not have the engineering ability to make their own automatic transmission. Studebaker didn't have the manufacturing ability. So they had Borg Warner making the thing for them. Well, Ford went to Studebaker and said, look, give us a license so we can buy these things from Ford Warner for our cars. And they used them in Fords and Mercury's and they called them Fordomatic and Mercomatic. They still used hydromatics for Lincoln's. Hydromatic was still the gold standard for automatic transmission. Well, eventually the Studebaker transmission became, like I say, the standard uh, and everybody used it. You know, one of the companies you don't hear mentioned with automatic transmissions in these early years was Chrysler. For some reason, Chrysler resisted having an automatic transmission. And they had a whole series of self-shifting manual transmissions. Uh, they still needed clutch pedals and none of these things worked really well. And in fact, you wonder how they could, especially in their expensive cars, you wonder how 
Chrysler or an Imperial with these clunky semi-automatic transmissions? And the answer was they didn't sell very many. And in fact, the company almost went bankrupt in 1954. So they eventually did develop an automatic transmission. They eventually developed one that copied the Studebaker uh, and became a very popular transmission eventually. But like I say, lack of an automatic transmission almost drove these people into bankruptcy. That and some other issues too. The original hydromatic fluid coupling and everything eventually became obsolete. I mean, like I say, after a quarter of a century, things changed. And they came out with one called the Hydromatic 400, Turbo Hydromatic 400. Basically, GM by this time had a whole bunch of automatic transmissions of various designs from just about every car division. And the management at GM said, this is nuts. We're spending huge amounts of tooling money and development money for all these automatic transmissions. And so what they did was they took all the people at Buick that knew about torque converters uh, and moved them down to Ypsilanti where the hydromatic plant was. Hydromatic people knew everything there was to know about gears, bands, clutches, and forced them to work together to make a hydromatic, the hydromatic 400 as a torque converter designed by the Buick people, uh, coupled to, the, to a three-speed planetary gear set uh, that was superbly designed uh, and and the controls and everything were just state of the art for 1965, 1964. Uh, I co-opted at Hydromatic in 1965. There's still two groups of people in, in engineering, the Buick people and the Hydromatic people. And they kind of kept to themselves. It was really kind of interesting to me as a, as a young kid to see this, but, uh, but one of the technologies that the Hydromatic people developed for this transmission was a vacuum modulator, which was a better way of measuring uh, how hard the engine was working than relying on throttle linkages and stuff like that. Companies eventually adopted this uh, for many automatic transmissions for many years. Yeah. But the Hydromatic 400 turned out to be just as durable of a design as the original one. And they wound up making this for uh, almost in 2000. So they got, you know, over 30 years out of this design. All the Hummers you see driving around in, in Iran and Iraq and all those places, they all have hydromatic 400s in them. Uh, and finally, finally they decided to quit doing that. But for a long time, this was a very durable and well-respected automatic transmission. Well, I like to think about hydromatic in the movies. And uh, everybody knows Lois Lane, right? Superman's uh, main squeeze. And what I wanted to really figure out recently was, you know, Lois Lane always drove Rambler convertibles, at least in the early years. Does, does Lois Lane's Rambler convertible have a hydromatic transmission? And the answer is, yes, it does. Her second one does. Her first one was too old to have a hydromatic. But the second one clearly has a hydromatic. And there's Lois Lane uh, driving down the road in her... Uh, Rambler convertible with the hydromatic and the Clark Kent's riding shotgun there. I like those curb feelers that those cars had, so you can kind of tell when you're getting close to the curb and not uh, scuff up the white wall tires. Well, Perry White, her boss, editor of the Daily Planet, of course, everybody remembers the Daily Planet, had, in the first season had a 42 Cadillac. And it too clearly has a hydromatic. Uh, and in fact, it's easy to see at one point near the end of the season, uh, Jimmy Olsen, the perennial screw up, actually causes the car to be taken by the bad guys who destroy it by driving it over the cliff. And you can see them reach in and move shift cliff. I never understood how Jimmy Olsen kept his job, but uh, he did. Anyhow, that's his uh, 1942 Cadillac with a hydromatic there. And, you know, Superman, of course, didn't drive. He flew everywhere. But his buddy, Inspector Henderson, drove a real fancy Nash, a Nash Statesman, country club Statesman. And it had a hydromatic. You clearly see him using the hydromatic uh, 
in that car many times. Well, people, I'm sure you recognize this car. It was originally a Lincoln show car, the Lincoln Futura. And it was used in a movie called It Started With a Kiss. It's a completely stupid movie. Uh, don't waste your time watching a movie. But uh, that car was made in 1954. And originally it had a hydromatic because Lincoln was still using hydromatics in 1954. And in the movie, uh, you watch close, you can see him putting the car into reverse with the hydromatics uh, reversed all the way to the right shift pattern. Uh, pretty interesting. The car was originally white and when they borrowed it for the movie, they just borrowed this from Ford. <laughs> they went and painted it red because it looked better in the movie. I don't know what Ford said when they got it back, but uh, in any event, but some years later, by the time Batman bought it, it uh, had been refitted with a later Lincoln engine and transmission, had a Ford transmission. People don't realize Batman bought a 12-year-old used car for his Batmobile. Uh, that's kind of strange, too. And The Godfather uh, didn't drive, at least in the original Godfather movie. But he was driven around in a Cadillac Fleetwood 75 with a hydromatic. Uh, and there's, there's glimpses of that also in the movie. Uh, and you can see sometimes one of his sons would drive and sometimes uh, one of his, basically, he had lots of people hanging around, uh, fellow gangsters would drive. But it uh, clearly has a hydromatic transmission. And then that particular identical car, which is why they stuck the Godfather in the picture. But it's clearly a hydromatic. So the hydromatic basically made it into popular culture in a lot of ways. Uh, and maybe only a few hydromatic fanatics like me would actually notice. But uh, so. anyhow, I think that's enough to talk about hydromatic. Uh, do people have questions? Anybody have hey, Thank you, thank you, Bob. If anyone has any questions, we invite you to unmute yourself and you can share those questions directly with Bob. <laughs> well. Yeah, Bob. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, yeah. My, my dad, uh, I grew up in North Central Wisconsin and my father was a General Motors dealer and he sold Oldsmobiles like from 1946 on. So when I was a kid, uh, I was born in 55. I remember the 64 Oldsmobiles and the 65s. Oh, and I'm a kind of a car guy. I mean, I, you know, it's kind of my blood. I can't help it. But, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, the, uh, the cars, I remember in 64, they changed because when it would accelerate, first gear would be like, what? You know, kind of rev. And then it would, boom, it would shift. And then it mm -hmm. would shift again pretty fast. So it was different than previous. Did they change the shifting? A little well, bit on that. In 64, Oldsmobile was still using hydromatic. And then mm -hmm. those cars had a very low gear, gear ratio in first gear. Right. Um, in 65, they started using the hydromatic 400, which was much smoother and, and much more uh, refined. Uh, okay, then what I'm... Okay, thank you, Bob. That, then what I'm remembering is the 63s and the 64s and the 62s. And uh, because I know that later on, like in 68, we had a, a 68 88 with a 425 in it. And that didn't, sh didn't behave like that. It, it was more right. normal. And then my dad yes. was always, he would always say, oh, you know, we're going to put it into passing gear. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about passing gear. And of course, those cars with those big engines, they get up and go pretty good. <laughs> yes. When, when they refer to passing gear, what they're talking about was if the driver pushed the gas pedal down, it would downshift the gear. So typically, mm -hmm. those cars with big engines would cruise in, in third gear. Hydromatic 400 had a third three-speed transmission. It would cruise mm -hmm. in third gear a lot. You didn't really need the lower gears for moderate acceleration. But if you really wanted to go, you push the gas pedal down, and it would downshift uh, into second gear, which would allow the engine to rev up, and that would really accelerate the car. If and you're going really, slow enough, it would go into first gear, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it had to be going pretty slow for that to happen. But okay. Really accelerate. Did Buick and ever when you have, let off, it would go back into third. Right. Did Buick ever have anything called the switch the pitch 
on their transmission for a passing gear or not? Yes, uh, the, the Buick versions, see the Hydromatic 400 got used in Buick. Buick had mm -hmm. it the first year. And Buick had worked on the, on the fluid coupling. Dynaflows had really complicated fluid couplings with as much as seven elements in some of them. And when they wanted to, for this car, for the Buick, the stator inside the reaction force that actually caused torque, they made the vanes so they could pivot and they had two positions. Uh, and one position basically gave it much more uh, torque multiplication in the torque converter at wow. a loss of efficiency. Other position made it more efficient. So when you basically in kick down, not only would, would the uh, transmission downshift the geared part, but the vanes in the Buick would, would switch the pitch. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes at the same time, sometimes uh, they were timed not to. And Buick did that for, I don't know, three or four years and some Cadillacs did that too. Yeah, uh, I had a friend. I had uh, a friend whose dad had one of those. I think it was a Skylark. You know, it was based off the Vista Cruiser with the windows in this in the roof. He had a mm -hmm. Buick station wagon like that, and he would, you know, step on it and it would. He would talk about switch the pitch, and the thing would take off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That was, like I said, that was Buick. That was a Buick feature. They eventually okay. decided that uh, didn't make that much difference. Mm -hmm. You know, you could. Get make torque converters that work pretty effectively without that feature. Yeah, I suppose uh, that the big, I, I suppose that the big V8s they had, they didn't, it didn't let, it wouldn't have made it matter that much. Yeah, that, that was part of it. They all had, cars all had big engines back then. And, yeah. but they basically made, refined and refined the torque converter so that it really just need to do that anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. And do it onto that as much for advertising as anything. Really. Ah. Uh, they wanted to, they didn't want to give up the name Dynaflow, but, but they did because it wasn't a Dynaflow anymore. And they called oh. it, see, uh, Cadillac and Oldsmobile would call it a uh, Turbo Hydromatic 400 and Buick mm -hmm. called it a Super Turbine 400 for a while oh. before they finally. Okay. Yeah. Um, see, another thing about Oldsmobiles in 60, 61 through 64, Hydromatic made a three-speed transmission out of their four-speed. Oh. Not a very good arrangement. That was called a roto. And you say they must have had a whole department to think up these names. Uh, <laughs> and, and the cheaper Olsen deals used that. It was not very good. And uh, some Pontiacs, cheaper Pontiacs used that too. Um, like I say, they only did that a few years before they gave up on that one. So you might have experienced that one. Thanks for the questions, Gary. Uh, I want to move on now to Ralph Fairbanks. Ralph, you want to unmute yourself and pose a question to Bob, please? Yes, hi, Bob. Uh, I've recently been watching these F1 races, and you know these cars go 250 miles an hour, and they, they've got paddles and all that. How, what does the uh, transmission in those cars look like compared to the, you know, the average cars? That the, are, you know, uh, how does it work? <laughs> Do you, do you know? Well, some, some of those cars are, uh, are using a, a planetary gearbox. And when the driver moves those paddles, uh, it upshifts or downshifts. And it usually, and sometimes uses compressed air to make the upshift and downshift happen really quickly. I mean, when they're, they're not worried about the smoothness of the shift in cars like that. You know, Other, another version uses a sliding gear transmission with multiple synchronizers that are basically very robust. And again, uh, usually compressed air, but sometimes hydraulics will make those shift when the guy gives the signal with, his, with the paddles. Uh, again, it's a very harsh shift. And generally speaking, those things only last one race. Sometimes they don't even last the whole race. <laughs> but uh, mm. uh, yeah, that's... Uh, some modern cars use a version of that. Volkswagen seems enamored of that, uh, where basically the, uh, they have what they call a dual clutch transmission, which is basically shifting a manual transmission by using one or the other of the clutches. Uh, that's you know fairly modern transmission development. Uh, and 
my, you know, my wife just bought an Audi and that seems to work reasonably well in that car, pretty well. Uh, although it's not as smooth starting off as a car with a torque converter. I, I have a question, Bob, can you hear me? Um, yeah. Did the, did the development of front wheel drive cars, which is pretty much standard now, mean that the transmission is had to be modified or is designed a little differently for front wheel drive? Well, I was working as a co-op student at Hydromatic when they came out with their GM's modern times, the first front wheel drive car. That was an Oldsmobile. And Oldsmobile Tornado. And a year later, the Cadillac Eldorado. And what they did was they took that Hydromatic 400. Let's see if I can go back to that picture, 400. Yeah. And they basically, the engine was in the normal place, off right behind the torque converter. And they took the gearbox and turned it around 180 degrees. So the output was facing to the front. And they put a big chain in between the two. And then they put a differential on the back of the transmission and, and shafts out to the front wheels. Uh, well, that was pretty revolutionary, 1966. And it worked very, very well. There were people that bought those cars, didn't even know they were front wheel drive cars. It was so effective and yet so uh, smooth. Transmissions, the, uh, basically the principles remained the same, but the configuration of the parts had to change. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the early Mini said crosswise engines. That was the first production version of that. And they all had manual transmissions. And the fact that all, all those transmissions lived inside the engine were bathed in engine oil, which wasn't really a good idea. Uh, but other, later on, they developed and others developed uh, crosswise transmissions. GM did one for the X cars in 1980. But other mm -hmm. companies did that in various ways, but it still basically took the, the power from the engine down to a transmission that was next to the engine. Some cars used gears, GM-like chains, um, and then from there out to the wheels, which meant they, the transmission had to be hollow so one drive shaft could go all the way through the transmission to the other other wheel. But uh, another another question. I, I wonder if you could uh, show us that car, that home home built car that you built from scratch. There's a picture of it behind you there, but. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of interested in, in how you go about building a car, <laughs> just one. <laughs> well, if I move to the side, you can see the whole car here. Yeah, that's... Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I worked for 50 years, and I have to admit, I worked on some real clunker cars. I'm uh, not going to tell you which ones. But I decided I want to make a car, a couple of cars that I really like for myself. And uh, basically, I drew a bunch of pictures. This one in the picture, here's my second one. Uh, my first one is a roadster, a big roadster that looks uh, sort of 30s like. And, you know, it's a matter of, of you know, cars are designed to start out with a styling drawing. And then the engineers usually have to fit the guts into it. Uh, and then there's a lot of arguing back and forth between the two. Uh, until they finally get a real car in the end. Uh, and that's more or less how I did it. I, I, start, I, had, I drew a lot of pictures to decide what I really liked. And then I kind of refined it down to the scale, the size, how big, you know, uh, what, what components that it fit. I'm, I'm six feet, four inches tall, right? And I wear a hat usually. So I wanted to make sure there was room in it for me and the hat. And, uh, laid it all out like that, cast around for parts that, that might work, made the parts that didn't work. My, my first car, I made the entire chassis. And then I uh, made the body. I first the, uh, took my drawings and made it the computer model, made that, made drawings from the computer model, made a egg crate model full size, uh, basically made a plaster model based on those, all those sections, uh, painted it and 
polished it so I could see all the highlights and stuff. Took a few tries, more than a few. And then I took, I made fiberglass molds off this model. And from the molds, I made the body panels for the car. And I put this, basically glued the body parts together and mounted them on the chassis. My cars are separate body frame cars, which is kind of a throwback for, our, for passenger cars. Although they make millions of pickup trucks like that still. Um, that's that's the, the short story. <laughs> and, and then I got it. it it's, it's a legal car. Michigan has a procedure for uh, uh, titling and licensing homemakers. It's, it's titled as a, an assembled vehicle. So, and that, that process was amazingly easy. I, I went to the Secretary of State's office with my paperwork and I expected to spend the whole day. And in fact, I was done in 10 minutes. Thanks for sharing, Bob, and thanks for the question, Tom. Um, we have another question here. I apologize, you're appearing on my screen as Freedom Tech. If you wouldn't mind identifying yourself, a uh, question regarding the future of transmissions and in relation to electric vehicles. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, Bob, we're, we've got someone who wants to ask that question. I believe they're unmuted. I apologize, you appear as Freedom Tech on my screen. Yeah, this is Daryl Copeman's. I'm there sorry, go, I, got, I got the wrong uh, information on there. But yeah, I'm just curious, what do, you, what do you see the future of transmissions in regard to all the uh, future electric uh, vehicles coming on board? Well, you know, uh, electric motors develop full torque at zero RPM. So they can accelerate the car pretty well from a standing start with no transmission at all. But uh, they lose efficiency at higher speeds. Ideally, you'd have a uh, electric car would have at least a two-speed transmission, the low speed and high speed. And what happens because the uh, electric motors have so much torque at low speeds, um, there hasn't been a, a durable, reliable transmission for that application. Tesla, when they started out, they were going to have a two-speed transmission, and it became pretty obvious right away that uh, that wasn't going to last very long, especially if people tried out the maximum acceleration of the car. But with electric cars, typically high speed performance, they have an electric motor that's way more powerful and need, needs to be for low speed performance. Well, this is all great fun if you want to smoke the tires, you know, and impress the neighbors or make the neighbors mad, depending on what kind of neighbors you got. Um, so I, what I suspect is going to happen is for efficiency, uh, uh, electric cars probably will have transmissions. Probably two speeds is probably enough, but who knows? And they don't need a torque converter because the, the, the electric motor can come to a complete stop, of course. But they do need to be durable enough for the, for the, uh, the torque. So, and the result of that means they could use smaller electric motors and get potentially get greater range um, on their batteries. And this is all potential. I haven't been involved with electric cars other than basically casually talking to people who are. But that's what I suspect will happen. But uh, was it Kate, um, Yogi Berra said, you know, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. Thanks. Thanks for answering that, Bob, and thanks for the question, Daryl. Our last question uh, is from Robert, who is asking, uh, what was the power glide? Can you explain that a little bit more, Bob? Oh, yes. The power glide was kind of a descendant of the Dynaflow. Uh, basically, Chevrolet needed one an automatic transmission. Dynaflows are quite complicated, multi-element torque converters and stuff. And the uh, power glide was... Uh, they took a Dynaflow, Chevrolet did this themselves. They took a Dynaflow and they just simplified it, made it lighter and smaller. And they gave up some of the theoretical efficiency of a Dynaflow, um, but they made it inexpensive enough so it could be offered in a Chevrolet. Uh, uh, I think it started in 1951, I believe. And they kept developing that and developing that for a long time. And uh, variations of it lasted, uh, shoot, I think into the 70s. And in fact, variations of it are still used in some race cars. When you get into really high horsepower 
low weight race cars where they only need two gear ratios, uh, power glide seems to be the uh, transmission of choice. Thank you, Bob. And thanks for the question, Robert. Uh, I think that is all the questions we have right now. So I'm gonna pass things back to Tom Glover to conclude us for today's session. Okay, am I on? <laughs> uh, thank you, Bob, for telling us all about uh, the development of the uh, hydromatic transmission. Uh, we, I think we learned a lot. Uh, some of it was quite complicated, but um, I really enjoyed your presentation and I think all the participants did too. So a big round of applause for Bob Elton. <laughs> well, thank you, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> it's always nice to know I'm not the only one fixated on automatic transmissions. <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, read the article in, in Michigan History Magazine, uh, which was really uh, the kind of the basis of, of what you said today, and I, I thought it was fascinating, and I was tasked with finding a speaker, so I thought of you right away, and it, it was worth it. Well, good. So Glad we got together. Again. Yep. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Bob. Park, good and drive. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Take care, everybody. And uh, I, I enjoyed the, the opportunity to uh, talk about hydromatic transmissions. Mm -hmm.